Welcome to another FAR walkthrough video from Superfast CPA. I'm Logan, and in today's video, we're going to be going over FAR Area 2, and this is Section G. This is an application topic. Calculate the carrying amount of accrued liabilities, such as accrued wages, accrued vacation, accrued bonuses, self-insurance liabilities, and prepare journal entries. And we're going to be doing that the Superfast CPA way, which is diving straight into the questions to learn the material. If you don't know much about our strategies, make sure you go to superfastcpa.com and sign up for our free one-hour webinar training where we go over the key ingredients to passing the CPA exam. Again, it's free and it's only one hour long and it's something you don't want to miss. We will show you how to be effective and efficient with your studying so that you don't waste months or even years of your time trying to pass this difficult exam. And after you watch that, you're going to want to learn more and make sure you check out becoming a Superfast CPA Pro member because just letting you know, in today's video, we're only going to be going over five questions but Superfast CPA Pro members who get access to our pro course where we explain the whole process in depth, step by step, they also get access to the full 10 question versions of these five question YouTube videos so that they can get more practice and more understanding by again getting access to those 10 question videos instead of just the five questions here. So make sure you check out the webinar, make sure you check out becoming a Superfast CPA Pro member, and with all that said, let's dive straight into the questions. All right, here we are at question one, and just a reminder, this video is kind of a continuation of the previous video. The previous video and this one are actually the same blueprint topic, but it was so broad covering not just payables, but also accrued liabilities. I decided to make two videos. So the previous video is talking kind of just more about accounts payable and things like that. And in this video, we're talking about accrued things such as accrued wages, vacation, and things like that. So as we dive into this, something we always like to point out is to read the last part of the question first, to give yourself context for the rest of the question so that you know what you're looking for as you read through it. And this might not seem super helpful in these questions because we're kind of going over the same topic over and over again, but it is a really good habit to be in because on test day, you're going to be seeing questions on a ton of different topics that you've studied, you know, over 100 or maybe 200 plus topics. And you need that extra context to quickly be able to know what you're looking for so you don't waste time reading through an entire paragraph and then realizing at the end of the paragraph, that you only needed a couple things from that paragraph. So that's why it's always a good strategy to do this. So let's get in the habit of it. Calculate the carrying amount of accrued wages that should be recorded as of the end of the accounting period, the Tuesday. Okay, so what does that even mean? Let's go up to the top here. A company has a weekly payroll of $84,000 for its employees with wages paid every Friday for the previous work week, Monday through Friday. The company's accounting period ends on Tuesday. Oh, okay, so that's why it's saying that they have accrued wages that they build up each week and the end of the accounting period is Tuesday. So we have to figure out how much wages they've accrued, they've built up without having paid them as of Tuesday, which is the end of the accounting period, probably month end or something like that. So with this, it's not too difficult if you think through it and think through the wording. So think about this. You could probably figure it out again if you think about it. If you have no idea how this any of this works though, that's okay. We're gonna dive straight into the answer to learn what we're doing because again, remember, we are using the questions to inform us what we need to know. We're using the questions to learn instead of watching hours of lectures and reading through a huge textbook. We're using the questions most of the time to learn. So if you want, go ahead and try it yourself. If not, let's go ahead and look at the answer together. All right, here we are. The answer is D, $117,600 is how much they're going to have accrued as of Tuesday at the end of the accounting period. So you might be a little bit confused by that. So let's walk through this. First off, we have to determine how much they are accruing each day of the five day work week so that we can then do the rest of this accrual. So it's not too difficult. They have a weekly payroll of $84,000. That means that for a five day work week, you divide $84,000 by five, and that gives you a daily wage of $16,800. So that's how much wage they're accruing each day as they go along the week. Now let's go down here. By the end of Tuesday, the company needs to accrue for the unpaid wages from, and this is the part that you might have gotten confused about, last week, which was five days, Monday through Friday, and Monday and Tuesday of the current week, and that's two days. And you might be confused by that, like, wait, no, they, they got paid on Friday. But remember, the wording actually says that they are getting paid every Friday for the previous work week, Monday through Friday. And that kind of makes sense because you've all had jobs at different points. If you're getting paid on Friday, you're probably getting paid for the previous week of work that you did, not for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday that led up to that payday because you're not going to get paid for the Friday that you are currently working in. You know, you're, that doesn't make sense because you haven't finished that work day. So they're not going to pay you for that work day. So it makes a lot more sense for them to pay you on Friday 
for the previous five days of work, not for the current week's work. So that could have confused you a little bit, but that's what's going on there. So they are accruing the previous five days that they haven't paid yet because they're going to pay it the upcoming Friday, and then they have to accrue Monday and Tuesday as well. So that's seven days that they're accruing. $16,800 multiplied by seven is $117,600. So that's how much they actually have accrued as of Tuesday, which is the end of the accounting period. And if you think about this, this means that technically they always have some accrued wages that they haven't paid yet because if they're paying for the previous week, then the four days leading up to the Friday that's payday have been accrued but not paid yet until the next week. So they always have a little bit of accrued wages in their wages payable account. So again, that means that they have accrued $117,600. And what the journal entry is for this, it's pretty simple. They're, every time they increase the wages payable, they're also debiting wage expense. So debit wage expense, credit accrued wages payable, and that is how you do that. So not too difficult if you kind of think through the wording. Again, you have to think of it as they're getting paid on Friday for the previous week's work. So that's why there's still five days that they haven't gotten paid for as of Tuesday. So that was a question on wages payable or accrued wages payable. Now let's go to the next question to learn about something else. All right, here we are at question two. Calculate the amount of accrued liability for each employee that ABC Corp should record at year end. Okay, so we're again figuring out an accrued liability, but we don't know what we're dealing with yet. So let's go up to the top here. ABC Corp has two employees, Jane and Mark, who accrue vacation and sick leave each month. Okay, so we're talking about vacation leave and also it looks like sick leave. Their accrual rates, beginning balances, usage during the year, and pay rates are as follows. So Jane had a beginning balance of 10 hours of vacation leave and 8 hours of sick leave at the beginning of the year. She accrued 8 hours of vacation and 5 hours of sick leave each month throughout the year. And during the year, she used 30 hours of vacation leave and used 18 hours of sick leave. And she has an hourly pay rate of $30 per hour. So that's, a, that's the information we need for Jane. Now let's talk about Mark. He had a beginning balance of 12 hours of vacation and 10 hours of sick leave at the beginning of the year. He accrues 10 hours of vacation and four hours of sick leave each month throughout the year. And he used 20 hours of vacation leave and 15 hours of sick leave throughout the year. And his hourly pay rate is $25. So with all that information, again, now we need to figure out based on the vacation leave hours and the sick leave hours, the amount of accrued liability for each of them that ABC Corp has to record at the end of the year. So again, we're calculating how much the liability for Jane and how much the liability for Mark will be at the end of the year based on how many vacation hours and potentially how many sick leave hours they have as well. So pause the video, think through this. I don't think that it will be too difficult for you. You kind of just have to pick your way through this. If you have no idea how to do this, that's okay. Again, we will look at the answer together, but if you want, I think you should give it a try on your own. And when you're ready, come back, we'll look at it together. All right, here we are. The answer is A, $2,280 for Jane and $2,800 for Mark. That's how much they're going to have accrued so let's walk through this. I'm going to scroll down just a little bit more to see the full explanation. Okay, and there we go. Now we can see the full thing because we already looked at the answer. So now let's see how we get that answer. So again, this is not too difficult, but there would have been one part that probably got you hung up. And I remember this being something that hung me up for a second when I was going through the exams myself. So let's walk through this. First off for Jane, she had a beginning vacation balance of 10 hours. She accrued eight hours per month times that by 12 months. That's 96 hours plus the 10 hours. That's 106 hours of vacation that she had throughout the year, but she used 30 of it. So at the end of the year, she has 76 hours of vacation leave accrued. Now for Mark, he has 12 hours at the beginning of the year. He accrues 10 hours every month. So multiply that by 12 months, that's 120 hours. So 12 plus 120, that gives you 132 less the 20 hours that he used. And that's 112 hours of vacation at the end of the year. And I promise I'm getting to the sick leave in a second here. But first, the accrued vacation liability for each of them, you just take the hours, multiply it by their rate. So 76 hours multiplied by $30 for Jane is $2,280 of liability that they have to have accrued for her vacation that she could potentially use. And for Mark, it's 112 hours at $25 per hour. So that's $2,800 of liability that they have to accrue for Mark for his vacation. So again, $2,280 for Jane and $2,800 for Mark. Now, throughout this whole thing, you might have been wondering if you haven't read this last part here, what about the sick leave? Now, this is something that I was a little bit confused about. And, you know, maybe this isn't a hard and fast rule, but it does seem to be something that's true most of the time for the CPA exam. For sick leave, they most likely wouldn't accrue sick leave on their financials because sick leave is generally unpredictable and contingent on employees actually needing it for illness. Unlike vacation leave, which is typically scheduled and has a predictable carryover, 
sick leave is uncertain, making it challenging to record as a reliable liability. So again, it seems like frequently, maybe not always, but at least as far as the things that I've learned, it seems like a lot of times sick leave is not going to be recorded as a liability in the same way that vacation is recorded as a liability because sick leave is so uncertain. They have no idea if somebody will ever use it or maybe one employee will use all of it. But again, they don't really know. Whereas vacation, almost everybody needs to take vacation. In, in fact, in a lot of industries, you're required to take a vacation occasionally. So again, that's why they're recording the vacation accrual, but not recording the sick leave accrual. So that could have been the thing that confused you. But once we realized that, the rest of it was pretty easy. So with that, now let's go to the next question. All right, here we are at question three. Calculate the amount of the bonus that should be accrued for the CEO at year end. Now I'm going to give you one warning about this question right at the beginning. This to me was a very confusing topic and it still doesn't really make sense to me like why on earth they would do it like this. I just think it's weird, but I just want to give you that heads up. Let's dive into the question and maybe you'll see what I mean. Maple Corp offers an annual incentive plan in which the company's CEO earns a bonus equal to 15% of the corporation's income before taxes and after deduction of the bonus. That's the thing that really holds me up sometimes. They're calculating the bonus based on 15% of the income after the bonus. That just seems like 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 backwards logic there. But again, that is something that seems to be able to happen. For the year, Maple Corp reported net income of $425,000 after both the bonus and income tax. The income tax rate is 30%. Okay, so with that, again, we have to calculate the bonus that they have to accrue for the CEO based off this information. If you're anything like me, you are probably pretty confused by this question. If you've done this before, though, that's fantastic. Pause the video and try to do it on your own to see if you can get the right answer. But if not, if that's really confusing to you, that's okay. We're going to look at the answer to learn how to calculate a bonus off of income after the bonus. So again, let's go ahead and look at the answer if you don't want to try it on your own. All right, the answer is C, $79,193 is the bonus that they have to accrue for the CEO based on this information. So let's scroll down a little bit more to get the full explanation. And all right, there we go. Now, again, this might be really confusing to you, but my goal with this question is to show you how to do it so that even if you're confused on why they would do it like this, you still know how to do it. So let's walk through this. Since the reported net income after the bonus and taxes is $425,000, we'll start by calculating the net income before tax, but after deducting the bonus. So since we have a tax rate of 30%, that means that the net income that we were given that $425,000 is 70% of the income. So 100% less 30%, that again means 70%. So that would mean that to figure out the pre-tax income after deducting the bonus, we can take $425,000 and divide it by 0.7 and that will give us $607,143. That is the pre-tax income after the bonus. So now that we know the income after the bonus, we have to figure out what the bonus is. Again, it's really weird to me that we calculate the bonus based off the income after the bonus, because how can we know the bonus that is taken out of the income if we haven't calculated it yet? Again, it's weird to me, but it does work algebraically. So let's walk through this. So to solve for the bonus, we have to take this 15% pre-tax income, which is the bonus rate, and we use it in this way. So the bonus equals 0.15 multiplied by the pre-tax income less the bonus, and that gives us the bonus. So what does that mean? 0.15 multiplied by $607,143 and multiplied by B means B, the bonus, equals $91,071 less 0.15B. So again, algebraically, we can take this 0.15B, move it over here, and now $91,071 is equal to 1.15B. And we can again do this one more time. We divide both sides by 1.15. So B equals $91,071 divided by 1.15. And that gives us a bonus of $79,193. Or it could also be $79,192 depending on how you round it. But, you know, $79,193 with all that. The easiest way that I've kind of thought about this to be able to do this is you have to figure out the pre-tax income and that can be easily done by just taking the tax rate, subtracting it from 100% and that gives you the percentage that wasn't taxed and you divide the net income that you're given by that percentage and that gives you the pre-tax income after the bonus. So you have to figure that out. So the pre-tax income after the bonus multiplied by the bonus percentage, those two things divided by one plus the bonus percentage will give you the bonus. So again, 
instead of having to do all of these, all this flipping around and things like that, you just take the pre-tax income after the bonus. Again, that's $607,143 multiplied by the bonus percentage. And you divide that by one plus the bonus percentage. So 1.15. And that gives us again, $79,193. So again, this is something that I found very confusing and I still kind of find confusing. And if you're still confused too, that's okay. The thing I really wanted to get out of this question is teaching you how to calculate the bonus in this situation. Again, just remember this equation. You take the pre-tax income after the bonus, which you can calculate up here, multiply it by the bonus percentage, divide that all by one plus the bonus percentage, and that will give you the bonus amount in these strange situations where the bonus is based off of the pre-tax income after the bonus. You might see a question like that on the exam, so I wanted to make sure that I went over that. Now that we've gone over that and I've shown you how to do it, even if you're still confused, that's okay. At least you know how to do it now. Let's go to the next question. All right, here we are at question four. What amount should Atlas Corp record as an accrued liability for workers' compensation at year end? Okay, so we're talking about workers' compensation. Let's go up to the top here. Atlas Corp self-insures its workers' compensation coverage. Based on historical data, the company expects to incur workers' compensation claims of $300,000 annually. For the current year, claims totaling $220,000 have been reported, of which $150,000 have already been paid, and the remaining $70,000 are still pending but expected to be paid in the next few months. In addition, based on actuarial estimates, Atlas Corp expects an additional $50,000 in claims related to incidents that occurred this year but have not yet been reported. And this can be something called like incurred but not reported or IBNR. You might not really see that on the exam. That's just kind of a term that I've heard in the past. What amount should Atlas Corp record as an accrued liability for workers' compensation at year end? So again, there's a lot of numbers here, but it's not too difficult if you kind of think through what has happened and what might happen in the future. So pause the video. I think you can do this one on your own. If not, again, we'll go and look at the answer together. But again, I think you could do it on your own. So pause the video, do this. And when you're ready, come back. We'll look at it together. All right, here we are. The answer is C, $120,000 is how much accrued liability they're going to have for this workers' compensation. So first we have to figure out how much they still have left from the pending payments. Again, this part's not too difficult. You take the $220,000 of claims. You notice that $150,000 of them have already been paid. So that means that $70,000 of them are still pending, meaning they still have a liability for them, but they're expecting them to be paid in the future. So $70,000 is part of the liability right there. And then we also consider the expected claims. You know, these are things that these are claims that have happened, but they haven't been reported yet. They expect that $50,000 of the claims related to incidents that have occurred but haven't been reported yet to also be a part of this accrued liability. So you take the accrued liability of $70,000 from the payments that are pending, and then the $50,000 from claims and incidents that have happened but haven't been reported yet, and that's $50,000. So you add those together, that's $120,000. Again, not too difficult. It's one of those situations where as long as you read through the question carefully, you'll pretty easily be able to pick out what is happening and what is going to happen in the future as far as the accrued liability. So with that, now let's go to the next question. All right, here we are at question five. How much should Future Tech have recorded as accrued liability for termination benefits? All right, so now we're talking about termination benefits. Let's go up to the top here. Future Tech Inc. is planning a restructuring that will involve laying off 30 employees on July 1st of the next fiscal year. As part of this restructuring, each employee still with the company at that point will receive a termination benefit of $8,000. They expect each employee to still be with the company at that point. So looks like they have a lot of loyalty. <laughs> this was decided in January of the current fiscal year. As of September 30th, nine months into the current fiscal year, how much should Future Tech have recorded as an accrued liability for termination benefits? So again, just to reiterate, in January of the current fiscal year, they decided this, and it's going to happen in on July 1st of the next fiscal year. So think about that. Think about how much they're going to have accrued for this. I, again, I think this, as long as you read through it carefully, you'll be able to figure this out pretty easily. So pause the video walk through this yourself and come back when you're ready. We'll look at it together. All right, here we are. The answer is A, $120,000, similar to question four, but for a different reason. So let's walk through this. Again, it's not too difficult. You just kind of have to walk through it step by step. We calculate the total termination benefit obligation. So they have 30 employees that they're going to lay off. They're planning to give each of those employees $8,000 as part of the termination benefit. So 30 multiplied by 8,000 is $240,000. So instead of having to pay that all right away out of the money that they have on July 1st, they're going to start setting aside money and start planning for it and also recording a liability each month so that they have that built up for when that occurs. So we have to determine the monthly accrual amount. The total liability of $240,000 will be accrued evenly over 18 months. And if you think about that, that's again, 
January of the current fiscal year, all the way through the current fiscal year till December, that's 12 months. And then all the way through January to June of the next fiscal year, because it's being paid on July 1st. So that means January through June is six months. So six months plus 12 months is 18 months. And sorry, I just realized that I had a typo there. They are going to be accruing $240,000 divided by 18 months, $13,333.33 per month leading up to the termination. So that's how much they're building up each month. And you can kind of do the quick math here. If it's 18 months and nine months have passed, that means that half of the liability has been accrued. So you don't even necessarily need to do this calculation because you can just think nine is half of 18. What's half of $240,000, $120,000. But you could also just do $13,333 multiplied by nine months. That gives you $120,000. So that's how much they're going to have accrued as of September 30th for the termination that's happening on July 1st of the next fiscal year. So they're halfway there. They are still accruing this. And then when it happens on July 1st, they will, of course, do that payout to each employee that is still working for them at that point. So with that, we've gone over a few different kinds of accrued liabilities, and I hope you learned a lot. Before we go any further, let's do one more part of the super fast CPA process called pillar topics. Now, the idea behind pillar topics is as you're going through the questions to learn the material, you will notice the things that keep popping up. You've seen three or four questions trying to teach you about different aspects of accrued wages payable, or you've seen three or four questions trying to teach you about the craziness of doing a bonus that is before taxes, but after the bonus. Again, that's still weird to me. But again, you will see that in the questions and you'll know that that is important because it will keep popping up. And so you know that it's a pillar topic. It's important for the exam. So you take a moment during or after you're studying and you write down these pillar topics in your own words, kind of a summary of the most important things you learned so that each day as you're doing this, you are building a repository of the most important things that you need to know for the exam in your own words, in your own knowledge, and that will help you be ready for test day when it comes. So with that, let's go ahead and look at the pillar topics for this video. All right, here we are at the pillar topics. Again, this is kind of a summary in your own words. So you might have written this a little bit differently than me, but this is what we have here for accrued wages. Accrued wages ensure that unpaid salaries for completed work are properly recorded. So, you, you know, you're making sure that you're building up and you have the amount of wages that should be paid, even if you haven't paid them yet especially when payroll timing causes wages for past work weeks to remain unpaid at the ending of an accounting period. So you want to make sure that you're doing this correctly so that you know exactly how much you owe people at the end of a, a period when you have to kind of reconcile things and you don't want to lose track of how much you owe different people. Accrued vacation. Accrued vacation liabilities reflect the employer's obligation to cover unused vacation days at the end of the period, accounting for balances carrying over under company policy, though just letting you know, you might see this in some questions. It's often limited by maximum carryover caps. So make sure you pay attention to that. We didn't look at that in this question that we went over, but that could happen. Also for accrued bonuses, accrued bonuses represent liabilities for performance-based bonuses frequently calculated on income after deducting the bonus itself, requiring careful adjustments to account for these feedback conditions before payout. Again, this is kind of a strange loop to me, but this is how you do it. Remember, the basic idea behind this, if you want to figure out a bonus, for pre-tax income after the bonus, you take the pre-tax income after the bonus, you multiply it by the bonus percentage, and you divide it by one plus the bonus percentage, and that will give you the actual bonus based off of, you know, being the income after the bonus. So I hope that you, that will stick with you. And then finally, accruals for self-insurance liabilities. Self-insurance accruals, such as for workers' compensation, remember we talked about that, or auto liability, represent anticipated claims, costs based on reported incidents, incurred but not reported claims, and expected future claims that a company covers in-house. And this is kind of a broad concept, by the way, self-insurance liabilities. Basically, if there's anything that the company is going to cover when it comes to its employees or its business, they are going to accrue liabilities. They're anticipating these things happening. And with that, we're done with the pillar topics. And before you go, make sure you check out our free one-hour webinar training on superfastcpa.com. Again, make sure you sign up for that because it's free. It's only one hour long, and we will teach you the key ingredients to passing the CPA exam without wasting months or even years of your time failing and paying for exams and losing a lot of money as well. And also remember that if you become a super fast CPA pro member, you will get access to a ton of great resources such as the pro course where we explain the entire process super in depth and detailed and teaching you how to study. Basically, you can also get access to our full 10 question versions of these five question YouTube videos so that you can get the practice that you need and get the extra help that you need. And we are doing these eventually we're working on it for every topic in the blueprints. It'll take a lot of time, but that is our goal. So make sure you check out the webinar. Make sure you become a super fast CPA pro member. I hope you liked the video. I hope it was helpful. 
If you did like the video, make sure to like it and leave a comment. And with all that, thanks for watching. I will see you in the next video.